thank you so much for agreeing to talk to our group. It's really been great to get to know you over the last month or two talking about your presentation. And I would like to um, speak about her biography before Ellen's uh, presentation today. She is a mosaic artist born and raised in West Philadelphia. She comes from a family of renowned visual artists and she's exhibited in numerous galleries in Philadelphia and New York, including Sandy Webster Gallery, Gallery 22, Rosemont College, and the African American Museum. She's conducted numerous workshops for different organizations, including the Mural Arts Program in Philadelphia, Living Cities, People's Emergency Center, and independently in different communities in the area. Her work can be found in various collections and Ellen's work is inspired by her love for nature, travel, and family. And Ellen, what, um, what has inspired you the most and sparked your interest in mosaics? Um, hey everybody, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I haven't, uh, I haven't worked with this group since uh, years ago. Well, it was when my father was still living. So I'm thinking six or seven years ago, I had the opportunity, I got a scholarship to uh, come to the SAMA conference that you guys were the host of down at the uh, Lowe's Hotel down on Market Street. And I got to meet mosaic artists from all over the country and buy some good supplies and learn about new, te new techniques. That was a wonderful experience. I got to work with Joe Brinman, uh, artist in front of the families, wonderful sculptor. And he would come volunteer with you guys all the time. And he worked on a mosaic that you guys installed in one of the local schools in Philly. And I had the opportunity to work on it. So it was a wonderful experience and a nice introduction to your group. Um, so let's talk about me. Um, without um, my family, I come from a family of renowned artists centered in West Philly. My mother was a fine artist, first black woman to win the Crescent from the Academy of Fine Arts. My father was a well-known muralist went to the University of the Arts at that time it was Catholic. Um, they had a community within my house growing up, artists from all over, a neighborhood people from all over. It was an open door policy to come in and they would work with them on, uh, on our classes and teaching them things. It was a wonderful way to grow up, you know, it instilled in me a love community and sharing your art. Uh, when my mother passed away, my father turned our houses and the courtyards in West Philly into a memorial museum. And Rindale officiated that in 98. And uh, we've been closed now because of COVID, but hopefully, you know, we're watching everything. Uh, we'll be opening back up this spring or summer. And you can find information about the family museum at tiburinomuseum.com. Okay. So Ellen, what first inspired you to um, begin your love for mosaics? I grew up, my parents, you know, always sent me to art classes at Fleischer Saturday morning and going to uh, more art classes uh, for kids. But mm -hmm. nothing really clicked. Like, I mean, I, I loved watercolor. That was my favorite, but uh, I worked a lot on ceramics with my mentors, Gail Scuderi and Joe Brinkman. And I remember working, I just graduated college to be a uh, history teacher. And I was working on a uh, mosaic. We got a, Gail got a grant from Mid-Atlantic Art Foundation to work on a mosaic peace pole with kids from the uh, West Philadelphia Parkside Community Center. And I was there working with the kids and like, I was having more fun than the kids at a certain point. It's like, okay, Ellen, you know, the class is over. Let's wrap this up. You know, I'm like, give me a few more minutes. And that's when it clicked. Like, wow, you know, here's something, you know, I'm teaching something, but I'm having fun with it. And that right. was when, that was when the spark was really lit. And I, I just love the art form of mosaic because it's so different from anything that my family does. Um, right. When you come from a family of well-known artists, there's a tendency for people to say, Oh, you just got where you got because of your family or you know you're still in their style or their technique nobody can say that because i went a totally different direction what i do is completely my own and i'm very proud of it 
Yeah, just getting to know Ellen over the last um, month or two, she is so passionate about her mosaics. I mean, every time I'm looking at you now and I, I just get excited because I know you want to get back out there and be in the community in person. This has been kind of difficult um, being apart from people, um, but you know, I'm glad that we're here to be able to share your artwork. Is this, is this one of your first pieces, New Day Dawning? Yes. New Day Dawning yeah. is, I think my first, well, it's funny that I would go so big on one of my first pieces. Um, my father always worked big, so I was inspired by him to work big. I think this is either my first or second piece. Uh, I didn't know how to cut glass, so I worked with scraps from Joe Brenman and Gail Scuderi, and I would go to uh, Sunshine Glass, I believe, no, Rainbow Glass up in Bristol. That's okay. where me and all the local Philly artists would get our glass from. Probably some of your members went there as well. Um, but I would buy their scraps. Um, and it's neat on this piece. If you look up into the clouds, those are like pieces of a Tiffany, uh, uh, you know, a trash Tiffany lamp I found. So to have the brass uh, work already done, the, um, you know, when you're making stained glass, the lead, you know, mm -hmm. when it's already done, I'm at a loss for words. Uh, that's in the upper right there. So, you know, I would just work with all these things that I had, but it's funny how you grow, because now looking back on this, I actually brought this piece out of storage to hang in my apartment. And it's just so big, I was a little worried about the walls. Um, it took me a long time to transfer to Weedy Board, because I'm hard at it. Mm -hmm. And let me just say, night and day, these old pieces are done on recycled wood, headboards, and interesting things. But the problem with that is, as you know, an average sized woman moving these things. Right. I would have to hire movers and to hang them. How you know, big you is it? You know, you don't want to take down somebody's wall. Right. Um, you don't want it to drop on somebody's head. So <laughs> I just can't say enough about beauty board. I wish I would have listened to my mentor sooner about using it. Which well, means Ellen uses her poor brothers a lot for moving stuff. <laughs> I do. <laughs> That's my brother, Raphael, guys. It's a team effort, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It is. It is. It really is. Uh, we are really learning that a lot with uh, this whole thing, the pandemic. No man's an island. You know, I mean, money, none of these things. Like, what do you miss most? You miss people. You right. miss social. You miss touch. Yeah. You know? Thank God I have my own. You know, right. right. I don't think I would have been able to live through this. Right, exactly. Um, how big is this piece? It's a sheet. It's big. It's a uh, standard sheet of plywood. Is four by what's a sheet of plywood? Eight by ten. Okay. Right. Four by eight. Four by eight. Thanks, Brad. Okay. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's impressive. <laughs> so I we're gonna back go, up. We're gonna go to the next slide. Please. Um, and um, oh, this is one of my favorites. Um, yeah. This is one of my favorites. Uh, after my mother passed away, my, my uh, mentor, Gail Scuderi, uh, she met her husband. Uh, she worked at my father's nightclub on South Street, mm -hmm. and she did cast of everyone in our circle, in our, you know, uh, our circle of artists, our group of artists. And my mother was one of those people. And uh, we were looking and looking for this after she passed away, and I finally found the cast of my mother's face. So, be, so to be able to make these casts in my mother's face, I felt like it's alive. It's a lot, you know, it's like you're recreating that person to have that. It was really important to me. So I did a whole series of casts of her face. But this one's so special because my dad did the painting on it. Oh. And he commissioned this from me before he passed away to, huh. to hang over his uh, bed. And he loved, he's the one who, you know, in all honesty, turned me on to finding uh, recycled things in the trash, shapes, because... The things you find, they're organic, you know, this was an old, you know, top of a cabinet, right. you know, but these things have such form, you know, built into them and they're so fun to work with. Um, it's beautiful. And this that. is called Big Ellen Rain Supreme. Because uh -huh. uh, my mother, you know, as you know, was an artist as well, but my father did the uh, glaze work on the face and I did the mosaic around it on the headboard. And I have ones that I made where I did the glaze in the mosaic. I actually should have included this in here, but hindsight's twenty twenty. But this is one of my favorite pieces, and it's you know it's dedicated to my. It's, 
it's a portrait of my mom. It's beautiful. Is it in the museum right now? No, it's here in my house. Okay. I keep it, I keep it near and dear to me. It's beautiful. Thanks for explaining Thanks. that. Um, and the next slide is another piece of Ellen's work. This what is another one of my favorites. Wait, go back. <laughs> this is another one of my favorites. This is a beast. It's on a solid wood headboard that I found in the trash. I was walking down the street, down the street from the museum. It's funny here in America, we brought the most wonderful, beautiful things. And I found this solid wooden headboard. And I said, came home and I said, dad, you gotta help me. You know, you gotta get wrapped in my, you know, you gotta get, you gotta help me get this home. And I got all my brothers and they drug it home for me. And I did the mosaic right on it. And I'm a big environmentalist. I'm, I'm, I'm very connected to nature. Without nature, there is none of us. Um, and it's funny, the title of this, I came up with this before the Dakota pipeline protest. And it's called Water is Life. In American Indian, that's Woody Matakoko. And uh, there was a big protest against the Keystone Pipeline. I'm a big anti-fracker. And I thought it was neat that they came up with that title because I had titled this piece that before that was their title. Um, and it's a cause I very much believe in. Without water, without nature, you cannot survive. You know, they just put water as a commodity on the stock market. Fracking is a process of extracting natural gas from the earth, but you have to use tons of fresh water to do it. And afterwards it's contaminated and radioactive. And you're stuck with this and storage of it and regulation as you just found out in Texas, Texas self-regulation does not work. So this speaks to my love of the environment, my love of nature, simply water is life. Without water, there is no life. And there's an ocean scene, scene of, you know, irises growing up and you know another uh, water, uh, the sun setting on Lake Champlain, which is one of my favorite places to go if I might have the house there. It's so warm looking, especially right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm holding on. I'm holding on. Yeah. We have, we have one one question for you, Ellen. Sure. Um, how about over here on the left? What is that green piece? It looks a little like a mountain. That green piece. That is Judith Schechter's handiwork. Uh, she donated to me a lot of her scraps. And I found this wonderful piece of hand painted glass there. And I asked her permission to use it. It's not a big, you know, but that's that's the ocean. That's the movement of the ocean. And there's a there's a little crack in there that hung at a uh, it hung at a museum, which I won't mention. Uh, and in storage, I mean in, in in traveling, even though, and this is one of the dangers. You have to be aware of as a mosaic artist. A lot of museums and stuff don't know how to handle our stuff, you know, because they hired a professional art mover and everything. So always get insurance on your stuff. But you know, something like this, there's no place way for me to replace that. It's irreplaceable. So it just adds to the character of it. It is what it is. Uh, but there's a little crack on there, you know. And I, not to point out, you know, that happens. And with you know, in life, we're not perfect either. Cracks and things happen to us too. You know, I'm, but it's, it, 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 it's funny, you know, how uh, we deal with this unique art form that, you know, it's it's not so common and not so easy for people to handle. Yeah. Know? Is it, Um, we have, a, I think, a follow-up question on the green sure. piece. Is it layered? Is the green piece layered? It's not layered. It's not layered. Um, she does this neat style. You know what? It could be layered. Actually, come to think of it, it is layered because I've had pieces of hers that it is layered. She paints on the different panes and then layers them together to get that 3D effect. It is layered. Right. It is layered. Okay, great. Um, and we have another piece of her work called Spring Has Sprung with a Curious Sun. <laughs> I love this piece again. It speaks to, I did this during, uh, I had a speak studio space up here on Lexter Avenue as part of my uh, neighborhood time exchange residency. That was a residency set up by Mural Arts mm -hmm. and PEC. P, um, and during this residency, I created this piece. This is a testament to my love of uh, nature. I love irises, I love flowers. And about the environmental damage, uh, climate change, 
you know, how every year the weather gets weirder and weirder, which you're seeing now. Uh, a lot of people don't see it though, because they're blind, you know, but I right. see it. I observe nature. I see the changes. So right. spring is sprung with the curious sun because every year, you know, it's it weirder and weirder. <laughs> Maybe next week we'll see some bulbs peeping up through the snow. Who knows? Yeah, how about that? How about that? Our fingers what, crossed. What's the size on this piece? Uh, um, that's big. That's, um, well, it's the, it's a big weedy board. You know what? How about I show you? Oh, great. How's that sound? <laughs> oh, okay, uh, I'm going to stop sharing so people can see you better. And I'm going to try hi. Oh, and I'm going to flip that around. Can you see it? Oh, yeah. Oh, OK. Great. Very nice. Very okay. nice. I'll go around slowly so you can see some, some other art. Nice. All right. Yeah. Okay. It's like a live gallery show, Ellen. <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> And we have one more piece of your work to um, talk about before we move on to workshops. Uh, this piece, and I have it right behind me so I can give you a, um, I'll give you a better view of it when I'm done talking about it. Okay. It's a little cut off in that photo. But working with my mentor, Gail Scuderi, she's, she's more the ceramic artist than me. I'm in her, her apprentice in that area. Mm -hmm. I love raku firing. As a matter of fact, we haven't raku in a long time. Hint, hint, Gail Scuderi. Um, <laughs> I love the technique that it gives you the oxidization when it comes out of the kiln hot and you pack it in hay and newspaper, the smokiness of it. And that's how that effect is created on the body there. And uh, horse hair, you put that on while it's still hot and that gives you the squiggly lines there. The only problem about this though, when you're transporting it, and showing it in museums, it can't be, it can be rubbed off. So again, you know, it's unique to our form of art. You know, it's area uncharted, that it, you know, you can't touch it. It has to be handled carefully enough, you know, because it's funny, people are still ignorant to the fact of, you know, not touching things, you know, people, you know, one of the first things you learn to not touch art, but a lot yeah. of people, especially my stuff is it's 3D, you know, I guess they yeah. wanna, but, uh, this got broke coming out of the kiln. I was going to ask you if this was intended to be one or two pieces. It wasn't intended, but I love it. Uh -huh. I have one that's a full cool one that actually I have to move here. But again, it's my older technique that's heavy. I got to figure out how to hang. Um, this is lighter though because I got I got more and more savvy on you know working with weedy board, working with different things. This is ceramic though, but it has lightweight wire underneath it that I attached to it. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, it, it was attached to a piece of recycled wood. I love working with recycled wood and stained glass done all around it. And it's called, I'm a little broken. Uh -huh. Aren't we all? Yeah. You definitely have to embrace the cracks. I think we've all learned that. Yeah. <laughs> you really do. You really do. There's a, a Japanese art form right. where they take broken pottery and they reattach it in do gold leaf Oops. and it's more beautiful because of the cracks. And I think that's a good comparison to people. Yeah. yeah, it's a very natural looking break too. There's no way you could have done that and planned it. No, no. And actually I have a face. I have a wonderful face. I did, it should be down here. Um, called, and that's, I'm a little broken, I guess one, and this is two. And it's a self portrait and it just, beautiful the oxidation it's like almost iridescent and the glass around it you know so sometimes these mistakes end up being the most beautiful things exactly and if you want to uh change your screen i'll flip around and show you guys this um full size right behind me. sure and we have a a question um sure i'll take it in one second figure. okay hold on i'll take it in one second can you guys see that behind me yeah yeah that's cool. And there's another cool. ceramic mask. Uh, that's raku fire. And see, that's what happens when something rubbed. It takes away the smoky effect because that hung in a gallery and in, in transport. Mm -hmm. And once that's lost, you can't redo it. You know, it's smoking from yeah. the kiln. So it's, it's the risk you take. 
Yeah. So you still have these plaster molds around? I do have the plaster. They're all in storage, actually, at my mentor's house. I think I have my face, my mother's face here, because I like to keep those near and dear to me. But my, you asked me, in, uh, how did I make the bus? It was a cast of my bus. My okay. mentor helped me make it. Um, and it's funny, because the first few I made, it was easy to get the clay. And usually, plaster molds, they get easier to take out of the more you use them. Mm -hmm. But uh, that, that, that's, uh, I guess it's the size of my bus. The sides, <laughs> the way the clay, that's a tricky one to get that uh, clay out of the mold. Well, thank you for explaining all this, Ellen. Um, we're gonna move on to talking about your workshops that you've done in the area. Sure. Um, my workshops happen organically through working with my mentor, being her assistant, to striking out on my own for mural arts. Um, I can't say enough. This one right here was from your arts at University Square, which is a senior home right here in my community in West Philadelphia. Uh, I ruptured my Achilles tendon right before starting this workshop, mm -hmm. and it was a blessing. You know, I, I can, I'm continually blessed in life that it was in a senior home because yeah. I was able to get around <laughs> on my scooter because I couldn't walk on that leg. Um, and they understood. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they they you know they got it. What wonderful people, what wonderful people. I've, I've run into them on the street since this has happened. And I can't wait till everybody's vaccinated. I can get back to them because they're going to need some art therapy more than right. anybody. I mean, the seniors in our community have been so cut off and isolated because of it. They're really suffering the worst. Were these pieces they made brought together for one mural? No. Okay. These were, uh, I was supposed to do a mural there in their space, but that didn't happen. Faith XL did a big mural on the side of the building mm -hmm. for mural arts. And this is the University Square building at 40th and Market. Okay. Uh, but I did a bunch of workshops with the residents there and they just loved it. I mean, they were, I mean, I get so much from this. Not only, you know, they see how much they get from me, but it's right. really an unfair trade. And in all honesty, I get a lot more from them, you know, and, uh, Look at this picture. She's just so proud of her creation. So happy. You know? <laughs> I think we have the next slide is also at University Square. This is University Square. The, the director's daughter jumped in because she was there for the summer volunteering. And she said, can I join in? And I said, sure. <laughs> and this lady next to me, I forget her name right now, but she was such a wonderful woman. She had such a sense of style. And she ended up coming to events at my job because I work for an art nonprofit, CEC, Community uh -huh. Education Center here in West Philly. And she, it turns out, you know, she knew my mother and father, you know, and, and like, you know what impressed upon me? Like, age happens quick. Like, you know, like you think it's so far off and, you know, and like, it's going to happen to you. It's going to happen to all of us if you're lucky. Right. You know, and it's like, it's, you learn so much, you know, when you're teaching workshops in any community you're in, because you're getting a perspective different from your own. Right, and people are relaxed and they wanna just talk to each other and chat and you know, it just turns into like one, one kind of like a party in a way. It really <laughs> does. It, it's funny how I, I, you know, I was a school teacher, a history teacher and like, I couldn't get out. You know, just if it wasn't, you know, the schools, the setup of the curriculum, you know, I, I, I was more of a prison ward, you know, and like being able to control and teaching are two different things. Right. You know, uh, but with art, like I said, you know, I really found my niche because it, it transcends all that. Because right. Because it's something fun. Right. And, you know, and they're learning in a fun way. Exactly. Uh, we have a few more slides. Uh, here we have the barns at the bank. Oh, uh, this, this was a, oh, no, yeah, that's the, uh, this was the Barnes at the bank. It's now, uh, they now call this Barnes West. The Barnes Museum does a lot of outreach in West Philly. Part of Mr. Barnes' legacy is he did a out, lot of outreach here in West Philly. Mm -hmm. uh, so in tapping into his legacy, uh, they do these workshops here in West Philly. And this was one of them. This was actually last February before ah. the pandemic hit. I'm I was supposed to be... Ah. Oh, and a flight to Mexico in March. And who was to know, you know, it's funny looking at your memories on Facebook, yeah. the countdown to when our masks go on. 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, right. Uh, but this was a real fun workshop. This is, you know, really big, say around 30 people. I did it by myself. Um, a lot of people in the neighborhood came out. I'd love to see that. A lot of older women in the neighborhood came out. A lot of younger people, couples with their kids. Right. Such a diverse group. And I'm always amazed because it's like when I used to throw parties in high school, my brother would make fun of me. So I'd always freak out. Nobody's going to come. It's going to be this. And I still have that childlike, yeah. nobody's going to come. And, and that's a good thing. You know, the minute you, when you lose that, you know, then you got a problem. You know, I mean, you always keep that childlike, you know, wonder, anxiety, because that means you really care. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And then it's an honor to work with the Barnes. I, I look forward. I've done two workshops for them. I have a great uh, working artist relationship with them, and I'm looking to build upon that in the future. That's great. Yeah, I didn't realize they did uh, programs outside of the museum, so that's good yeah. to know. Yes. Um, we have, you had also talked about a workshop you did um, from participants from New York. There are about 80. People. Yes, Living Cities is a big nonprofit in uh, Philly. I'm sorry to cut you off. Uh, a big nonprofit up in New York. They come down every year and do their retreat. Hopefully they'll do it this year. And who knows how COVID is going to change things. Right. Uh, at my day job, I'm the assistant director of nonprofit here in West Philadelphia called Community Education Center mm -hmm. at 3500 Lancaster Avenue. Wonderful live jazz concerts in the summer, every second Friday of the month. Uh, we have dance. We have a theater. You know, we're still really eventing ourselves, though, how things are going to change with COVID. Right. Uh, this past summer, we did a lot of outdoor programming, but this was before COVID. This was right. one of the biggest workshops I had to do as of yet, that I've done as of yet. Uh, this was like 80 people. And I was just getting over my leg being hurt. And at the last minute, I realized, yeah, I can project and I can, because it, it was on a time frame. I actually call it like speed mosaic. Right. Because I had a an hour and a half each day, and they had a strict set up schedule. So I, I recruited my brother Raphael, and I said, Raph, I'm gonna need you to come in. Because I gotta get all the supplies out to everybody, and you know, pop, pop, pop. You know, I'm dynamic and I can control a room, but physically, I wasn't able to get this stuff to 80 people and to run on this time frame. And uh, what fun, we got it done. And uh, they loved it. As a matter of fact, they ended up allotting more time cutting off, you know, making uh, like a breakout time so people can come up with them as they more. Because people love that a lot more than right. the other programming that was being offered. Um, so what a success. I look forward to working with them in the future. Um, and what an honor. Yeah, yeah. We have one more uh, workshop. The last one you did before lockdown where you, you can see you have your mask on already. This was lockdown. <laughs> This, this was locked down. This is how I'm constantly been blessed to still be able to work with people uh, to find a way because I have not done the Zoom thing other than meetings or presentations, but I don't want to teach that. Way. It's something I've resisted because mm -hmm. a lot of my magic is being there one on one. Right. You know, I you know I'm I'm a dynamic, outgoing person, and a big part of that is being in person. With Exactly. Uh, so I had the wonderful opportunity. Uh, Shana Mitchell, who was their director of programming, uh, had me come in November. It was one of those beautiful days in November where we had like 67 degree weather. And this was a big one 30 yeah. people, socially distanced. So it can be done. And this is going to be my model for the future socially distanced. Uh, the new way. <laughs> yeah. Um. We are going to also congratulate you for earning this fellowship with the Mural Arts Program. And last, I think it was two weeks ago, there was a live Zoom with the Mural Arts Program. And Ellen, she was here, one of the panelists speaking. Um, and would you like to fill us in about this? Sure, uh, fellowship for black artists was a way to support African-American artists uh, during COVID. Uh, you know, we're hit harder than anybody, uh, financially, spiritually, and also because of all the racism, you know, and the way that we've suffered mm -hmm. under this. I mean, I'm still, I haven't had a good cry. I haven't broken down. I mean, 
last four years was freaking tremendous. You know what I mean? And the, the, the normalization of racism. You know, I, I, you know, I don't even want to speak on it too much because I don't want to break down in the middle of the Zoom, but I'm still processing. You know, it was a lot. Yeah. So this was uh, Mural Arts way of giving back to Black Artists this fellowship. And it was an honor. It was a lot of odd opportunities to network with them. You know, I've done work for Mural Arts in the past, but this mm -hmm. is, you know, them centering in on, uh, on us and advocating for us. And this leads into my next project. I'm going to be, uh, I start next week. I have a, a busy week next week. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm glad we fit this in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll be uh, starting workshops for the porch light project. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's going to be down in Suburban Station. And the porch light project is a joint collaboration with the city of Philadelphia's Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services. Mm -hmm. Health and wellness, it wants to promote health and wellness amongst Philadelphians by offering opportunities to contribute to meet meaningful works of art. So I'll be having these, they have these uh, week long workshops and I'll be coming in twice a week in a studio in Suburban Station working with uh, homeless individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll be 10 people, different every week, and I'll be teaching the mosaic. And I'll also be looking at people to possibly work with me on a mural that I'll be doing down at Suburban Station for Mural Arts for this All right, so well- it's that's a great honor. It's different. It's unlike anything I've ever done before, and I'm looking forward to it. Great, thanks for um, filling us in. And if there's any opportunity, I'm not too far away. I could come down and take some pictures if you'd like and share it with everybody. Oh, <laughs> yeah, the documentation. Uh, I have a lot of documentation of my different projects. It's just a matter of finding it, and that's a big thing. You know, I learned that from my uh, from my parents. Right. You know, you got to be your own advocate, and you got to, you know, time passes really quick. You know, so that's all you'll have. Yeah. Well, we definitely worked together putting this presentation together and, and you had a great amount of photos that we were able to put them in order and um, support the, the talk today. So we, do we have any other questions, uh, Suzanne? We have one uh, question from Aya. She, going back to the community projects, do you cut the pieces or do they cut, or do you pre-cut them or do folks cut them while you're doing it? I found a great place that my mentor hooked me up with. I've, you know, experimented with this for years. That does tumble glass, but it's not, a lot of people just give you these generic squares and I don't like that. I want them to have the experience of the glass that the glass I first worked with that came from artists. There are scraps that have forms and, you know, are not, traditional shapes because they're a lot funner to work with so i buy them free tumbled scraps but there's one particular dealer that I, I like to go to they were actually out for that bartram's workshop so i ended up bringing some of my own scraps because i wanted to have those organic circular shapes as opposed to just cookie cutter squares cool all right any other questions for Ellen? This is a really wonderful opportunity, Ellen, to get to see your work. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs>